a student of economics, I thought, let me also uh, look at the entire issue of capitalism and patriarchy through the lens of the discipline of uh, economics. Uh, so that it also helps me focus uh, what I need to say, otherwise this entire topic is vast, capitalism and patriarchy. So I thought let me use the lens of economics uh, to actually uh, tell you, uh, you know, uh, how I uh, approach this particular uh, topic. The second uh, thing which I thought I'll also tell you is when I started getting interested uh, in, in studies of gender and uh, this thing, I also started looking at uh, this entire issue of feminist economics. So we now have this very specialized journal called Feminist Economics. Of course, a lot of people write in other journals also. Uh, but this particular journal specializes in critiquing the discipline of economics and also telling us what are the newer things that the, the feminist economics are bringing uh, to the discipline of economics. So many of us who have been taught in conventional economics courses are actually now going back to our discipline to say all these years our engagement with uh, feminist theory, uh, with field-based research and so on and so forth. How do we take it back to our discipline and if we have to teach our discipline, how would we teach it differently, uh, right? Uh, so a lot of people have spent their entire lifetime looking at the discipline, having their leg here and then, uh, you know, another leg on understanding what, uh, what feminist theory is bringing about and then taking it back to the uh, discipline. Uh, is also largely informed by a very uh, well-known uh, feminist economist, Nancy Folbra, right? A couple of them have also been very, very, uh, 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 you know, active. Uh, and I realized that when I was, when I, when I started doing this work on feminist economics or looking at, uh, uh, you know, economics from a feminist lens, I also realized how these people have been uh, because economics is one discipline which is very resistant to any kind of a change and uh, unlike other many other disciplines and how uh, um, several of these people uh, including Nancy Folbra and you know Jude Nelson and so on and so forth how they've had a struggle to actually uh, break into the American Economic Association and which has its annual conference and also have um, a session every year on uh, uh, you know, from a gender perspective. So it's been a great uh, struggle that, uh, at least I've read it. I mean, it's not that I've met any of them, but I've read it and I've been kind of uh, really awed by, you know, the kind of struggle that people have had to actually put through to get into this kind of. Till even today, um, many of us are not considered as hardcore economists, right? So uh, hardcore economics things will not uh, 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 you know, see us as people, they think that we have strayed away from the discipline of uh, economic, that doesn't bother us, uh, you know, that doesn't bother. But what is it that this insight uh, 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 from feminist theory has actually brought to the discipline of economics? So I'm just trying to see whether I'm able to communicate to you uh, uh, this particular, through this particular lens on this theme of capitalism and uh, patriarchy. So what is it that I'm, uh, what is it that I'm trying to actually do in this is, um, when you're talking about um, uh, development economics in particular, uh, so how does, how does actually, uh, uh, you know, how does gender uh, figure in this entire discipline of development economics that we, uh, uh, that we teach to uh, students and, and which we have uh, ourselves learned. Of course, when I learned development economics, um, I hardly learnt gender in that, right? I hardly learnt anything about gender when I studied uh, development economics. But today we do not teach development economics without, you know, bringing in, uh, uh, bringing in uh, the, the theme of gender. Uh, I must also say that at this juncture I am not complicating it further by saying that what, how would development economics look like if caste was also brought in or if environment was brought in or whatever it is. So, 
uh, uh, so there is a there is enormous amount of work now that has been done uh, using feminist theory to complicate development economics by bringing in issues of caste by bringing in issues of environment and so on and so forth but today i'm looking at it through what feminist uh, 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 economists have done uh, looking at it through the lens of gender and how they have you know managed to uh, bring integrate this into uh, development um, uh, uh, economics w one of the other thing is because you have like in every other discipline uh, you also have economics uh, uh, discipline uh, which talks about uh, newer kind of theories that are coming in so one of them is what we call as new institutional economics uh, and many of it, uh, this new institutional economics has actually been developed much more for uh, to understand management theory, right? Uh, so, uh, so very often uh, the mainstream economics discipline would talk about uh, 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 in a very individualistic manner and say how the firm behaves or how the individual behaves uh, in the market or how the firm behaves uh, in the market and what goes into the determination of why the firm is uh, 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 you know doing what it is doing how it is organizing the factors of production and so on and so forth uh, so uh, people have critiqued that economists have critiqued that and brought in the lens of what we call institutional economics and saying that the organization of the firm it is not only an individual this thing there is a there is a whole organization there and it is an institution and how do you look at it now what feminists have done is that use this theory of institution and saying that if you look at it if you look at institution of the family if you look at several other institutions including economic institutions and how uh, 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 if you look at it from a gender lens how does it impact economic outcomes and how does it impact lives of men and women in, in society and therefore what feminists have done is that they have used these newer uh, 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 you know uh, uh, sub themes of economics that have come about institutional economics and so on and so forth and are saying that if you bring in this approach of institutions but when when you are talking about gender the institutions of how the labor market functions how trade unions function how uh, uh, economic institutions function it is not only at the end of the day to say how your national product has increased uh, uh, you know how you produce things better but it is also how what implications does it have for people's lives and welfare of people and and therefore the organization of these institutions actually are extremely important and that is what feminist uh, uh, economists are actually doing because and why is that important is that every time uh, 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 the conventional economists talk about they make certain assumptions about behavior of people right so they make certain assumptions about behavior of people and that has implications for how i behave in the marketplace and how i behave in my individual home for example one of the important assumptions if you are a conventional economic student uh, one of the uh, important assumptions that is made is that what drives you to set up an enterprise in the market what is the driving force behind enabling you to set up an enterprise in the market and that is what in economics conventional economics is called self interest right so it is self interest wanting to so so i set up an enterprise not not only because i want you to supply you with bottled water or anything uh, and i'm so concerned about your health yes i am maybe concerned about your health i know but as a conventional economist i know there is a demand for bottled water clean drinking water so i produce that particular product but behind that what is the self interest is that i will make a profit by selling you this particular thing your demand is met but at the same time it is my self interest which has driven that particular activity and in the bargain i am also making a profit out of it so that self interest is one behavior that we assume when we are doing it uh, and what is it what is what is a, what is the same person who is driven by self interest in the marketplace what is it that drives this particular person in the household is this term called altruism right so these economists conventional economists have 
for the same person they have two assumptions made one is in the marketplace it is it is uh, it is self interest which is driving me but it when, when it comes to the household it uh, i am very altruistic i am very concerned about the welfare of all members of my family and so on and so forth and therefore the economists are very very happy with using the family or the household as a unit of analysis and they don't unpack the family or household and say there are five members in this particular family maybe they are all pulling in different directions so we are not making that particular assumption so what are what is the contribution of feminist is unpacking this household and methodologically critiquing economics by saying that how can you have a person who is driven by self interest in the market but in the same person when comes to the household suddenly becomes altruistic so there is a problem here feminist economists have pointed out saying that there is a huge methodological problem that you have that you are saying that household is you if you take the household as a unit of analysis in in many of our program why is this important not only in the abstract it has a very very real uh, problem because many of our programs many of the policies that we have in our country very often take the household as a unit of analysis you get one ration card you get one one card to do something and what is the assumption is that 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 family is considered as a unit of analysis not the individuals within the family a uh, part of this entire thing about how the household functions how the system outside function so constantly it is very difficult uh, at point very neatly to say this part is patriarchy and that part is capitalism so constantly how one one meshes with the other to produce certain kinds of particular outcome so your household is is a both the both the institution where i work and the institution where i live both are part of this system of capitalism as well as of a patriarchal household so so what uh, what feminist economists are saying is that constantly what you need to understand is that what 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 the institutional approach enables you to do is that it actually enables you to unpack these institutions and much more important is that constantly bring out what is the implication by uh, 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 by unpacking this how do you actually understand uh, the outcomes of these particular kind of organization of these particular institution if the family is organized in a particular manner if the household is organized in a particular manner what is the implication for those members of those particular household young young males young females children growing up so on and so forth so what is the implication of a particular organization of the family similarly if if the organization where i work where we all work is organized in a particular manner uh, that institution is organized in a particular manner then what is the implication of that for for people and that is why uh, uh, people like nancy folber and all are saying that uh um you constantly just many of the conventional economics constantly go on only finding out how you know how unequal you know gen, they uh, a kind of mapping gender inequality so they are saying that we have to move beyond this kind of or uh, mapping this gender inequality we have to const- we have to go back a step back a bit look at the institutions that are uh, 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 you know uh, uh, that justify this gender inequality and and how do we move forward is to actually find out if the institution is organized in this particular manner which is producing this gender inequality what is the implication of the short term and long term implications of this kind of gender inequality that it actually maps rent seeking coalitions based on gender create significant gender bias in social institutions and strongly influence market outcome what do you mean by rent seeking coalitions that we are talking about the common sensical understanding of rent seeking is corruption so why do economists persist in talking about uh, calling it rent seeking and not using the very common term corruption uh, is that very often you need to analytically um, segregate uh, different ways in which you can practices can be corrupt not all of it could end up in monetary kind of outcomes okay so in our common sensical understanding when i say so and so is corrupt or whatever it is i i obviously mean that i have to pay to get something done 
uh, which should have been normally done without any payment as a citizen, as a, a person who is you know, entitled to certain services, I should be getting it done, I should not be paying for it. But very often that does not happen, we have to pay to get certain things done. But here, uh, uh, um, you go beyond all of this to say that uh, um, you know, th th there are certain practices which, which become embedded in society in the way in which uh, uh, in the way in which social institutions are set up. And these practices actually uh, may, may or may not result in monetary outcome, but they could result in other kinds of outcomes, which is equally also corrupt practices and which could also be legal very often. Because the social institution is organized in a particular manner and the legislation laws of the country follow a particular thing, it becomes very, very, it also becomes very legal to do those kinds of things. You just quote the authority and say, too bad, this is the way recruitment has to be done, you do not qualify and I, uh, you know, somebody else does it and uh, 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 this is how it is done. The other thing is that a lot of people, a lot of people in authority have a lot of discretionary power. So if I have discretionary power, then how I use that power could also lead to this kind of rent seeking. Uh, part of it could be monetary, part of it could be I am exercising my authority which comes with this discretionary power that I have. So there is a lot of literature that economists have written on this rent seeking behavior and one of the reasons why they go on pushing this entire market thing is to bring down this rent seeking kind of behavior because they say the more discretionary power is centralized in certain kinds of people, the more there is a chance for corruption and all of this. So therefore, one of the reasons, you know, why economists, why we get angry about, you know, market, 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 there is a rationale for why people are pushing through market, because what is it that they see otherwise? They see otherwise that in a lot of societies, people misuse the authority that they have uh, and they translate into so much of corrupt, corrupt uh, kind of a practices. And therefore, there is a there is a large number of people who will say, why do we need this? Let the market decide everything. Okay? We are not getting into all of that discussion. If there is some discussion on it, we will get. But there is a rationale as to why uh, people push through this market because they are fed up with the kind of corruption and the discretionary power that people in authority actually, instead of using it, they misuse it. Okay? Now, in this context of our capitalism and patriarchy, how does this rent seeking become very important? What feminist economists have pointed out is that the social organization of institutions, the family, the trade unions, the state, and many other uh, the organizations where we work, the corporate sector and so on and so forth. So what happens is that over a long period of time, the manner in which they have got organized, the manner in which including our data collecting agencies like the census and national sample survey and all of them have got organized, it has benefited one gender much more than another gender. So over a long period of time, they are saying that uh, very often people have colluded, including say for example, uh, uh, people come together in these kind of coalitions, uh, 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 whether it is a planning commission, whether it is the uh, you know, trade unions, whether it is doctors association or whether something. So what do you do is that you form a coalition and you set certain kind of parameters which actually in excludes other people entry into that particular thing and you benefit from that from that particular kind of coalition that you have formed. So over a long period of time what has happened is that how did women come to perform much more of the household work? How did this institution or family get itself formed in this particular manner where we are you know where we find ourselves as women doing much more of the household work? But today, and today, so the different question that we are forced to ask is that if, if, if neither male nor female want to do the household work, and household work is not necessarily only cleaning, cooking, it is also bringing up the next generation of labor. If neither male nor female want to do it in the family, then who will do it? So are we asking those questions? We don't have a, we don't have a ready-made answer. But if we, if we don't want that conventional kind of an organ institution, which has this coalition, which has served one gender for such a long period of time, 
this formation of the household where women have taken on disproportionately a huge amount of the burden of the household work and of child care if if women if women tomorrow say we don't want to do it then who will do it do we have an answer for that so are we going to break this coalition where which has served men uh, which has served men uh, or one gender much more i'm not saying all men are like this or all women do that there are now large number of women who may not want to do it there are large number of men who may be doing household so we are not talking of that but across the globe what we find is that a disproportionate amount of work is being doing uh, I, 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 and that is somewhere over a long period of time and we have very good articles written across the globe much more coming from uk and us uh, which has which has which, for example articles telling us what were you know two centuries ago what how did the census uh, uh, how were the census collected what were the definition that the census used about work being done by male and female what were captured in these census and how is it that we have come to a situation where when you are talking about a worker and work you have very specific definitions which leaves out a lot amount of work that women particularly are actually doing so it is a long it's a huge trajectory that feminists have actually uh, looked at you have history of statistics and women have written very interesting articles on the history of statistics actually telling us how earlier you know over a long period of time we have arrived at a definition where much of the work that women are doing actually gets left out so we have very interesting uh, this thing what happened in our case because we were a colony of britain our first census was done in 1881 by which time a huge amount of the discussion that took place in uk and us about definitions of census and everything had already taken has already you know got completed and we got our census in 1881 with very specific definitions of what is productive work and what is unproductive work and we find very often that a large amount of work that women are doing falls in the category of not so product economically productive work right so so there is a so how has it arrived at and there is very interesting hardcore economists sitting in britain um, if any of you have studied economics marshall was one of the very prominent economists that we study in our conventional economics so for a very long time marshall was heading the british uh, you know census uh, uh, this thing and he was instrumental in actually saying no 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 housework and everything is not productive work it doesn't contribute anything to the economy it it does not result in tangible output and so on and so forth so all the you know economics jargon and then he said this is not to be counted as work and since he was the commissioner of census at that point of time in britain and for a very long period of time that became the standard definition of what is what will go into productive unproductive work and so on and so forth though earlier unlike the us the uk census was much more driven by medical people who wanted information on about children and others working in factories and everything to actually find out who are these children who are recorded as workers and what will work for a child actually do to their health and so on and so forth so there was a very different reason why uk was collecting statistics at an earlier period but later on it became an economic activity and therefore the entire definition changed and when we became a colony of britain that lock stock and barrel that was actually you know adopted by our country and since independence it's 70 years down the line we could have changed it but we have not changed it so we are sticking on to what has uh, you know with uh, and so what are the feminists in our country actually doing the feminists in our country are actually fighting a losing battle with the census and the nsso office constantly telling them to do specialized kind of uh, statistics uh, data collection to actually net what women in this country not only women what men and women and children in this country are actually doing right so so there is a lot of uh, 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 you know that kind of an activity that feminist economists in this country are doing uh, banging uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, after this government came into power we have the niti ayog but before that we had the planning commission in our country and one of the things that the feminist economists in this country did was got together 
and sat with members of the planning commission and actually critiqued the um, uh, the plans of the country the before it was put out like the draft 11th five year plan the draft 12th five year plan uh, so there was a group of feminist economists who actually sat with the planning commission members went through every every chapter of the plan draft chapter of the plan uh, and gave their comments and said how do we want this to be uh, changed and uh, you know the implications for women and so on and so forth uh, so all of this was done but but the coalition that i'm talking about this rent seeking coalition uh, the planning commission um, uh, uh, members uh, the members of the planning commission would not want what they call they did not want to disturb the structure of the economy so they did not want to uh, disturb the structure of the economy and therefore they only uh, i mean they actually literally mocked at us when we made the presentation to them and they said yeah yeah you'll get more toilets you know we are not asking at that point of time we were very clear we are not asking them to build toilets or drinking water we are saying we we are actually showing them with data a lot of our feminist economists are very well trained in statistics and data they are all econometricians and everything so they, it's not that they are not skilled or anything so uh, um, and they are also being they have also been part of finance commissions in our country so they have actually shown with data what is the productive e economic productive contribution of women to different sectors of the economy and they are saying why is it not getting uh, 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 you know uh, uh, visibilized in the in the uh, plan document so that is what they were saying but they said if you if you have to tweak or you have to change the way that collection of data is this thing you are changing the main frame and we are not prepared to change the structure of the thing right so what this is what we are talking about that the present way in which it is structured the present way in which the system is structured the way the data is collected and what is put out as as a pattern of development of the economy it actually benefits one gender much more than it benefits the uh, other uh, this business of capitalism and patriarchy that we can look at is uh, is that one of it is on uh, women's access to property right and why uh, 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 why that becomes very important uh, in our discussion on capitalism and patriarchy uh, women's access to a property becomes uh, extremely important is that a lot of economic activity uh, and particularly when when you are talking about economic development where you are saying that um, a, 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 a indicator of development would be uh, how many of us have gone into what we call as non farm employment so that is a sign of modernization now uh, in this in this entire business of modernization and so on and so forth so how do you get out from this into another kind of an activity you need certain capabilities so one of the capabilities that you require is you you must be skilled you must be educated you must have higher education to actually go out of this kind of thing into another kind of activity once i am skilled i have the education i also need resources to actually set up enterprises and so on and so forth so your modernization idea is you have to be individualistic you have to be uh, capable you have to have education you need uh, you need resources that actually doesn't cohere with my institution of the family which is still stuck in some very traditional kind of a situation so my family and my inheritance laws and my access to credit is all stuck in a in a time warp so i don't have access i don't have my marriage laws my uh, you know inheritance laws and all of it see to it that that has not changed and that doesn't give me very often access to resources or uh, you know and that doesn't make me a uh, ownership uh, so uh, i may not get inheritance rights i may not get rights to family property and so on and so forth now this modernization drive and the way my institutions are 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 not very often in sync so what happens is that the question that feminist economists have asked is and i'll just read out to you one um, question so it's a very interesting question that they have said is that how are women losing more from a male dominated modernization than from male dominated tradition right so the question that people are asking is are we losing much more uh, from male dominated modernization than from male dominated uh, tradition so so the reason why access to property is that uh, 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 it becomes very important is because 
how do i then how do i then you know uh, 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 also get out of this business of set up enterprises become entrepreneurs and so on and so forth and the other thing about modernization is that um there is a there is there are dissolution of traditional families and so on and so forth right and my modernization drive my attempt at empowering myself getting into a job wanting to have a different way of life that may be that, that may be the same or a different from the male wanting to have you know a particular kind of life and a modern life now gets into a loggerheads with this particular another gender so what happens is that when when you are when you uh, uh, when there is a break in the particular family and you don't have access to property because your institutions have not changed then then what happens is that very often this drive individualistic drive and the way the traditional systems are you find yourself very often that you may be much more poorer than what you were earlier right so therefore we find that very often women remain in these kind of institutions women remain in this because constantly they are weighing the consequences about that i have my education i have my job but i also have three little children to look after so if i move out of this particular thing what is it do i have an access to property do i have access to a good job and um, how does society look for me will they give me a, a roof you know will i get some kind of a, a house for rent so on and so forth do i have the wherewithal to pay these things so very often you are actually weighing these kinds of consequences right so therefore this access to property is not simply a social justice issue the access to property is a very real economic situation that one actually has to grapple with because you are now moving into a situation where families are dissolving people are left with having to look after children and and therefore this is becoming a a huge issue in our drive towards this modernization very often when you don't see these things together you are pushing education for women you are giving them certain kinds of things but you are also saying at the end of the day this is enough you get into get married and get into it and then therefore there is also a very very uh, you know a, a, a disjuncture that we actually create in our society by not looking at many other factors that are actually are linked Uh, so that is one the second thing that i quickly wanted to say about i was telling you about four uh, uh, the thing um uh, you know i i've already spoke about explicit and implicit contracts governing intra family distribution of resources the one point that i want to say about this is that uh, uh, uh because we have this assumption economics has this assumption of altruistic behavior in the household and the household is very often in conventional economics taken and in all our data collecting agencies and everything very often it is household as a unit of analysis that is taken um we don't realize we don't have much information about how resources get distributed within the particular family and uh, on top of it when you have inheritance laws and everything um uh, which are which are against one gender and you know much more uh, uh, this thing towards one uh, another gender so what happens is that that also becomes a basis for why over a period of time you find societies like ours discriminating against girl children right so there is a basis there is an economic very often an economic basis for why because of the patriarchal setup of the particular households and uh, 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 the way it is or uh, the way it is organized you find that that becomes a reason for why why they uh, uh, you know discriminate uh, very quickly also uh, um, uh, a lot of out migration takes place of a lot of men in our country because they're looking for jobs they have to uh, you know go out agriculture is not viable so a lot of men there's a lot of out out migration of men from uh, from households now initially what we also have is we have a lot of anecdote about how initially there could be some remittances coming up but over a period of time those remittances may dry up you don't know whether the person who has migrated is still alive working not working in what condition and so on and so forth so that is one part of the research that needs to be done but the other part of it is that what happens to the family that has been left behind and for whom the remittances don't come and if you don't have so there is a lot of labor that women perform on the farm where they have been left behind so there is labor but there is no ownership of that land 
because as of now still that land piece of land on which this woman may be working is not in her name and if that land is not in your name then you are you don't have access to many of the formal credit systems that are there because they require you to produce a document which says that the land is in your name so there is a lot of a implication about what happens when when you're uh, 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 you know when you're driving for non-farm employment when you're driving for particular kinds of things and your other kinds of systems do not favor or have not changed and do not favor one gender or they favor one gender over a, uh, uh, another gender uh, Okay, I'm not getting into much more into uh, 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 a lot of things about labor market. I've already told you about how, uh, 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 you know, how census data is collected and makes a lot of work of women invisible and so on and so forth. Uh, but some of, the, some of the things that we actually need to relook at as far as our labor market is concerned is that, uh, is that when you're talking about a country where Upwards of 85 to 90 percent of workers are, are looked at upon as informally employed workers, which means that most of them do not have a piece of paper to say they are employed here, this is their employer, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, what happens is that many of the benefits that existing labor legislation actually provides become almost totally, uh, you know, not. Uh, 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 you know, uh, applicable to many of these people. And one of the things that affects women most is, for example, maternity benefit. So I, uh, uh, the maternity benefit at 1961, it was passed in 1961 in our country. And it is supposed to, uh, it is supposed to apply to temp, uh, permanent, temporary, regular, etc. Right? Now, this etc. word is very important, I realize, because I did a study of some 30 uh, Supreme Court judges of the country and I realized that a lot of people in our country were denied maternity benefit because they fell in that etc. And what is that etc. that they fell in? They were not, they were neither permanent, they were neither temporary nor they were regular, but they were daily casual workers. Lacks and lacks of women in the country are daily casual workers and therefore I am not talking of all the people who are not working, I am talking of people who are working and who are entitled to this maternity benefit but don't get it because you fall in that extra uh, category. So this is how, uh, uh, this is how being informed and that is what the feminists are doing is asking for maternity benefit to be universal because how long will you keep on fighting and saying that it has, you know, this should apply, you recognize them as worker, you, no, you, this is not going to happen. So 90% of your workers, 80% of your workers in the country are not uh, you know, informally employed. So this is not going to happen. So what you need to do is that fight for that maternity benefit is universal, right? So there are many, many issues like this, which many of our systems in the country are based upon me being recognized as something. I should be able to recognize who my employer is. I don't know who my employer is because I'm doing some home-based work. So I don't know who my employer is. So are you going to deny me some kind of benefits because of those kinds of things? So that is uh, 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 this thing. A huge amount of work, and that's the last point I'll do, is that a huge amount of work um, is, being, uh, is being done in our country, but much more also remains to be done, is that how do you actually estimate what we call as, or uh, uh, give some kind of uh, a value to what we call as non-market work? Lots and lots of people increasingly for different reasons over a long period of time are actually, uh, uh, you know, doing this kind of work. So uh, where, does the, where, where does economics and feminist economics come into this is that uh, um, when, when, when we say that a lot of people in our country are un uh, unemployed or very poorly employed, a lot of activity that could have been that is and that is not taken care of by the state through public services public provision of child care or public provision of health care and so on and so forth then becomes a uh, uh, become the burden of the household so when people fall ill when they be become ill who is the person who actually takes care of this particular person 
So if you have a terminally ill patient, you have people who have met with accidents at their workplace and have to be taken care of in the house. Apart from all the uh, you know elderly and childcare that I'm talking about, there are many other kinds of things that need to be actually taken. So if you do not have institutional support for all of that, then who performs this particular work? Would you call this work productive or unproductive work? How do you categorize this particular? Obviously, it is not market. It is being done in the work. So there are theories which say that is done for love. It is done for this. But the fact is that time and effort is required, and a lot of money is required to continue with this kind of a work. So, so the estimation of some of these, uh, I'm only taking off uh, some part of the care work that I'm actually talking about. But there is a range of activities that household members, and I'm not talking about only women, I'm talking about many members of the household who actually pitch in to do things. Why do you pitch in to do things? Because things are costly outside, you don't have the income. And therefore, by doing many things at home that you could have otherwise bought from the, this thing, you're doing it at home. So in economics, we impute certain values by how much you have saved. If I have to buy this thing in the market, it would have cost me so much. But by doing it at home, I am saving this much of thing. So there are micro level studies which try to capture this. But on a larger scale, what is the implication that my development is not translating, translating into better and better welfare. The nature of my development is actually pushing a lot of things which at some point had gone to the market, it is again being pushed into the household. Once it gets pushed into the household, then who are the members in the household who are left holding the baby and how this is actually to be done.